was my father's company. Yeah, but he went nuts and we took over. He's my best friend. I'm married to his sister. But she's an idiot. Leave her alone. I love her. <laughs> hello, hello, good morning. Horns is blowing and I'm pissing off the neighbors. Other way, Tommy. Oh. What the heck? In recent memory, there hasn't been a show more underrated than The Troiters. Premiering in February of 2017 and lasting only two seasons, this show managed to make a long-lasting impression in my mind. On the surface, this is just another show about two friends who work together to solve an issue in some quirky fashion within 22 minutes. Every episode has a surreal, almost improv feel to it. Too comfy? It's nice. You guys done jerking each other off? You see jizz everywhere, Leah? Yeah, Leah, if we were jerking each other off, there'd be jizz everywhere. I'll put it in our bed. The cinematography is very grounded, which adds to the comedy. They have an ability to draw you in with each scene. It's almost hard to keep up with all the witty writing and weird things happening on screen. The writing style is very similar to that of the Venture Brothers. The continuity in this series is pretty amazing. Simple jokes that seem like random throwaway gags end up being plot thickening devices later on. This is something that the Venture Brothers do quite a bit. Unlike the Venture Brothers who drag these jokes out throughout several seasons, Detroiters use this tactic to conclude each episode. With these small details and continuities, it creates a wider world beyond the screen. Each character has their own ridiculous backstory. Every crazy thing that happens feels real, even if it's meant to be a joke. In other shows, little throwaway gags are just that. but. In the Troiters, little throwaway gags usually end up being the reason why the episode concludes. In episode 4 of the first season, Devereaux Wigs, probably my favorite episode of the series, Rhonda Devereaux, owner of Devereaux Wigs, hires Sam and Tim to make a commercial for her wig business. The opening pitch includes a little throwaway joke about the wigs not being made with dead people hair. The plot of this episode starts when Rhonda is presented with this pitch and hates it. Not only does she obviously want the mention of dead people hair to be taken out, but she wants the jingle to be sung by real singers. <laughs> wow. I mean, I mean, let's look at real singers. I mean, I'm right here. I'm listening. I'm going, I'm all like, duh, WTF. I mean, she's like real singers. To and I'm like, you face, are just to your face. dumb. This is when the two's journey to find a singer begins. Somehow the two friends end up singing some karaoke and it's obvious that it's Tim holding them back when it comes to singing the jingle. Just when Sam tries to bring up the idea that maybe he should sing the jingle by himself, the bar DJ mentions that legendary singer Freddie Motown Brown is there tonight. Sam takes advantage of this interruption and says they should try to get Freddie to do the jingle. After volunteering to give him a ride home and having a long night of shenanigans between the three, Sam and Tim almost blow it by telling Motown Brown that the story behind his hit song is actually pretty crappy. That's the whole story behind Ocean of Tears. It's not a very good story, Freddie. It's not great. What? It's not a good story? It's not a good... It's not a good story? Well, f*** you, dude! Getting them kicked out. With a lack of other options, Sam is forced to come clean to Tim about his not so great singing. But before being able to do so is interrupted by Freddy, who says he admired their courage for telling him his story is bad and will do the jingle for them, sparing Sam yet again from having to hurt his best friend's feelings. They all go to the recording booth and quickly get the jingle done. Tim stays behind and tries his hand at the jingle after feeling a little left out. It's here he finally admits to himself that he can't sing, and the commercial was better off with only Sam singing since the beginning. Even though the jingle sounded great with Freddie singing it, as an act of friendship and love, Tim destroys the tape and all of the copies like Mr. Robot. Look, we have other copies of that, so don't worry. No, we don't. I erased them all. Oh, really? You erased all the copies? Yeah, I erased them, so now Sam has to sing the song. How? What do you, how, what, how did I erase them? I went in the computer, I hacked into it, and I erased them all just like Dr. Robot does. You mean Mr. Robot. Shut up, Leah! And tells Rhonda that they won't do the commercial unless Sam sings it. Tim storms out of the office in anger, but Sam follows him to tell him the real reason why he never told Tim about 
is bad singing before. This makes Tim realize that they truly are partners and the name of his dad's former company should reflect that. As a symbolic and unnecessary gesture, Tim buys a new sign for the building and also another sign at a protest. I need you to make me a sign. I won't make a sign with the words dick, pussy, or shit. Please print legibly. Wait a minute. What if my name was Dick Pussy? Is your name Dick Pussy? For the sake of this argument, yes it is. Okay, well I'll make whatever sign you like, Mr. Pussy. Oh, please call me Dick. Dick Pussy, professional shit kicker. The two friends end up at the bar, sharing some beers, watching the Daily Walton Who's cast. They see that Rhonda Devereaux does in fact use dead people hair for her wigs, getting her shop temporary closed down, which means they don't have to decide on a commercial, solving the initial problem of the episode, and also showing us how strong Sam and Tim's friendship is. Don't worry, I forgot this episode was about wigs for a moment too. The ridiculous situations and nonchalant reactions make you feel like you're visiting another world. The world of Detroit. This is mostly due to the writing team following a rule that Matt Stone and Trey Parker made famous. The writing rule of but and therefore. We found out this really simple rule that maybe you guys have all heard before, but it took us a long time to learn it. But we can take these beats, which are basically the beats of your outline. And if the words and then belong between those beats, you're f***ed. What should happen between every beat that you've written down is either the word therefore or but. We can use episode three of the first season as a great example of this. Sam is outside working on his house when he meets a girl, but Tim's stomach is upset. Therefore, Sam has to go and help his best friend. Tell him to bring the Verners. My guts are going nuts. And he wants you to bring a Verner. Yeah, I heard him. But when the Verners kicks in. Tim said to tell you the Verners started working. Ah, that means he had to go home and dump. Everybody knows what that means. Yeah. Sam is left alone. Therefore, he's forced to wander the streets by himself. But he gets mistaken for a male hooker and doesn't realize this. The entire episode continues that but therefore cycle. Nothing random ever happens. There's always a reason to why it happened. I ignore that and I'm not paying for that. It's a freaking scam, dude. Compliments of Councilwoman Gwinnett. Oh. The continuity and great writing continues in season two, but it becomes a little less subtle and a little bit more absurd. Nice to meet you, Trevor. Hey, Tommy, what's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? They also went for long-term jokes lasting a few episodes. Sam's girlfriend being a great example of this. Yeah, we almost got engaged. I put a ring in a piece of cake. I ate the cake. And then when we went through your stool, there were two diamond rings in there. That's how I knew you were cheating on me. Even though I don't think season two was as strong as season one, I still loved it. The writing remained clever and unique. I really believe that if it had a chance for a third season, it would have found its stride. It would have found its sweet spot between adult swim absurdity and genius level writing that shows like Atlanta and community have been known for. Oh no, we don't want to be in the commercial. Oh really? We think you guys would be great. We're afraid people will recognize us from our user submitted Pornhub video. Pardon me real quick, I have to check my email privately. Uh, okay. Uh, well, in that case, we hire a spokesperson. Who do you want representing your company? <laughs> we would like someone with intent. She stomps on his balls. He's a naughty boy and she stomps on his balls. Oh my God. I know. Let me see it. Yeah, here you go. Before Ben's watching, I think you should leave. I wasn't really for sure who Tim Robinson or Sam Richardson was. Exactly, the bones are the skeleton's money. In our world, bones equal dollars. That's why they're coming out tonight to get their bones from you. The skeletons will pull your hair up, but not out. I knew Tim from his short-lived days on SNL, and I knew Sam from being in that Chris Pratt Amazon movie and his recent film adaption of the video game Werewolves Within. I really became a fan of the two comedians and I look forward to their next project. If you haven't seen this show yet and you're a fan of shows like Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Venture Brothers, and SNL, then definitely give Detroiters a chance. I thank you guys so much for watching. 
Laters on the menj. Can you read the card, please? Mm, we want to apologize for Tim's behavior. We assure you this has never happened before, and it will never happen again.